Hello and welcome to Projector, and on this instalment, Tom Cruise races against time and puts his body on the line in Mission Impossible Fallout. After a deal goes wrong and three Plutonian cores fall into the last remnants of the Syndicate, now calling themselves the Apostles, Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise, and his IMF team, Ving Rhames Luther and Simon Pegg's Benji, are tasked to recover them before they're used for devastating ends. However, the CIA and its director, Erica Sloan, played by Angela Bassett, assign their agent, August Walker, played by Henry Cavill, to join and martyr them on the mission. Elsewhere, Ethan is pursued by MI6 agent Ilsa Faust, played by Rebecca Ferguson, and once more confronts the Syndicate's sinister leader, Solomon Lane, played by Sean Harris, on a mission that threatens both the world and what Ethan holds most dear. It's been 22 years since Tom Cruise first rebooted the 60s TV series for the big screen, initially directed by Brian De Palma, which was a critical and commercial success, although it was criticised for having a very murky and convoluted plot. Nevertheless, in 2000, we did get a sequel, directed by John Woo, that had a very different style and aesthetic tonally, but it was ultimately a misfire. It did seem like it was a bit of a van project for Tom Cruise, and it was blighted by production problems. And after a long hiatus of six years, J.J. Abrams held the third entry and helped steer it back on track. He's remained as a producer for all the subsequent entries since, but it took when Brad Bird inherited it for Ghost Protocol for the series to really find its footing, because that's the template that all the subsequent entries have been following in, and in particular, director Chris for Macquarie, who has held the fifth and sixth entries, Rogue Nation, and now Fallout. Macquarie may not be a very familiar name, but he should be. He's the writer of The Usual Suspect, and he's actually co-written a number of Cruise's scripts. He's his regular script doctor, and he's held several of Cruise's other movies, not just in Mission Impossible. He also held the first Jack Reacher movie. And so, what he brings to the table here is something that's actually quite different from the Mission Impossible franchise, a recurring director for a change. And even though they've tried to change things up from the last entry, there's still a lot of continuity from it. And so this is the first entry that really feels like a direct follow-up. I do think that Macquarie has learned a lot from his experience from Rogue Nation, which I liked quite a lot, and really put it to good use here, because, my goodness, Mission Impossible Fallout, I'm putting it down now, this is the action movie of the year, hands down, I will be very surprised if anything tops this this year. Mission Impossible Fallout is such an overwhelming experience that it's hard to know where to start discussing it, but I think the easiest place to be would be the stunt, because that is what has defined this franchise from the very beginning. You think about that first movie, and chances are you're thinking about that CIA break-in sequence, where Ethan dangles from the ceiling trying to not set off the sensors in that secured room. That is the barometer that all the big set piece moments in this franchise has been measured by and they shattered that in the fourth film where Tom Cruise is scaling up the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa, and he's doing it for real. And that is something that has very much been a staple of the Mission Impossible franchise. I think they learned very early on that people really responded to having actual stunts in these movies, not things happening on green screens. You compare that sequence in Ghost Protocol to something like Dwayne Johnson's Skyscraper and that moment where Johnson is scaling up the side of the building and it's a pretty shameless copy, but there's no danger in it because we know that he's not actually doing it. He's up against a green screen. The mind can tell. You can really spot the difference between where they'd actually done it for real and in camera and where they just tried to trick you into thinking that they actually did it. But it certainly sets Cruise in the tradition of Buster Keaton or more recently Jackie Chan very much putting his body on the line for our entertainment and you've got to admire that commitment, regardless of what you think about him 
you know, off camera on a personal level, his absolute determination to make the best film possible is evident in every single Mission Impossible movie, whether they succeed or not. And that is something that is in itself, I think, has actually bled over into other aspects of Cruz's work. All the films that have come out since Ghost Protocol I think have had a bit of a Mission Impossible-esque touch to them, for better or for worse. I'm looking at you, the mummy. But generally speaking, I think that that is very much why these films work as well as they do, because when you see what happens in them, you are gasping, you're going, oh, oh. And the reason you're doing that is because you know that when Cruz is riding on a motorcycle around the Arc de Triomphe going against traffic, you know that he's doing that for real. There's nothing really tricking you out about it. Sure, there's CGI augmentations here and there, but the main body of it, they, they did it exactly how you see it. The previous movies have been defined by that big central set piece moment. Fallout doesn't just take that one step further, it takes it several steps further. It is an embarrassment of riches. It just keeps stacking them on top of each other to the point of almost sensory overload. Any self-respecting action movie would be proud to count just one of these sequences amongst them. They would be standouts in any other movie. Here, they're just simply to be topped by the next big action set piece. And there is a lot of real technical skill being put in all of them. To give you a real example of that, early on in this movie, there is a fight in a nightclub toilet, and it's a martial arts battle, and it's really quite lengthy and brutal. And what makes this stand apart from a lot of other action movies is that you can tell that Tom Cruise and Henry Cavill are really putting their backs into it, literally. And that's the difference, you see, because in a lot of other action movies, and what is very prevalent among the modern editions of the genre is that they substitute having good action choreography for editing because the stars of the movie can't do the stunt work, they can't do the choreography, so they have to go around and hide that fact. Here, they don't have to do that. The camera sits a bit further back, you can actually see the motion in the frame. You get the sense of the impact and the geography of the situation without the editing having to do the work for you. It's not having to cut on a, on a punch to make you feel the impact because of the sh sudden shift. You're feeling that because you can see all the action for yourself as they go around all this fairly large location. I think this is the best action set piece set in a toilet since True Lies, and that isn't even the best action in the movie. That's simply off the starter menu, and that's really quite something. And generally speaking, the movie is a combination of really solid direction, great fight and stunt choreography and really great editing that knows exactly when to cut and when not to cut. And there is a real perfect balance here. You're just left simply breathless at the end of each of these moments. You just get the sense that Tom Cruise really is setting an almost impossible bar for himself in all of this. I mean, I, 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 I'm almost worried about encouraging this sort of thing because I don't want actors to try and kill themselves for the sake of our entertainment. But nevertheless, there is a real thrill and charge to this movie that I haven't felt in an example of this in a long time. I think the closest examples to how exhilarated I was at points during this movie would be Mad Max Fury Road, but I don't think I've had quite so much of a white knuckle experience watching a movie just completely on the edge of my seat since the raid. Each individual set piece is a marvel. You've got a sequence where they're actually doing a halo jump and that's Tom Cruise doing it. He's jumping out of a plane. There's a there's a cameraman with a, jumping out in front of him with a camera rigged onto his helmet and this is probably some of the best sky diving stunt work since Moonraker, that opening set piece, and there they didn't have Roger Moore doing that stunt 
stunt for them. Here they have Tom Cruise actually going in here, and yes, they've augmented it with a CGI storm, but there's still something so very real there, and that's something that you haven't seen in a lot of other movies. Sure, you've seen Halo jumps, but normally they're just stock footage from the Charlie Sheen movie Navy Seals. They really, really want to push the boundaries in everything they do, and I just commend them for it. I think even if the script was merely functional and it was just there to ferry us from moment to moment to moment, this still would be a phenomenal action movie. But what really kicks it into greatness is that emotional connection. You genuinely feel like Ethan and his team are in real peril. There are genuine stakes in this movie, not just on a world-ending scale, but on a personal one as well. It establishes that right from the very start that it is going to be hitting home for Ethan. And as hinted at by the title, it feels like the films are culminating here, that it's bringing back everything from all these previous entries and all the decisions that Ethan has made, that all the choices, all the times that he's gone rogue, they are going to impact his decisions in this movie and he's going to have to confront his own belief system. They established very early on that Ethan cares about the singular person to the point where he would actually jeopardize potentially billions of lives. That's the situation that they've now ended up in and they're having to rectify. The question is where that actually makes him a good spy. You really get a sense of how he thinks as a person and we've got hints of that in the previous movies but not as much as we have done here and they even bring back his wife Julia from the third movie once again played by Michelle Monaghan and that has major ramifications for this movie but even in the team element of the film that I think is something that has made this series come back from where it once was. The big mistake in the second movie is they pushed that team element into the background. It became the Tom Cruise show and what J.J. Abrams did and then Brad Bird ran with is that he pushed the team back onto equal footing with Cruise again and so in this movie they each have something to do. You've got Simon Pegg's tech expert Benji who is pushed even further into the action in this movie. Pegg actually gets a full-on fight scene to handle in this film. Elsewhere you have the other long-standing mainstay of this series, Ving Rhames, playing Luther. There are several moments where he really gets surprisingly intimate and personal and that was something that I genuinely did not expect. At the very start of the movie that character is put into jeopardy and that reverberates in him for the rest of the film and that is something that is really really effective because of the fact that we have this long history with him we know that he's one of the core elements of this series and yet very early on I was wondering are they going to kill him off and you spend so much of this movie going well, any one of these people could go at any time. It sets things up as being that potentially dangerous throughout the entirety of the movie. But Macquarie expands upon the work that he'd already done in Rogue Nation by bringing back two key characters from that movie. Sean Harris's Solomon Lane, who is the first time that a villain has come back for a subsequent Mission Impossible entry, and they very much build upon the relationship that they'd already established in the previous movie that he's very much meant to be the opposite of Ethan Hunt in that they are both intelligence operatives but Solomon went rogue. He turned terrorist and he's become this kind of doomsday prophet and as such he really gets under Ethan's skin. He becomes this literal nightmare figure. Even whilst in captivity, Ethan is still afraid of him. And Harris is really wonderful at playing these queasily intimidating figures. But they also bring back Rebecca Ferguson as Ilsa Faust. And again, in this movie, you're not entirely clear what her motivations are. She's very much this third party for much of the first half 
of the movie very much kind of just sitting on the sidelines of the fray, occasionally intervening and seemingly trying to stop Ethan. And you don't understand why she's doing it. But nevertheless, she becomes this sort of roadblock that they have to work past. And so you're not sure whether she's friend or foe. And some of that is to do with the fact that they were constantly changing the script whilst they were shooting. But you know what? It really does work. The reason this movie is so compelling isn't just the fantastic action set pieces, but on a story level, there's so much intrigue. Sure, it gets a little bit convoluted at points, but the movie is constantly turning. It's constantly trying to defy your expectations, even between beats you're never quite sure where you stand with the events as they're playing out. And that's really something that works this movie's advantage. You've also got a really key new character in the form of Henry Cavill's August Walker and the relationship and the sort of rivalry between him and Ethan is very much at the center of this movie. August is very much the hammer to Ethan's chisel. He is brute force all the way through and he does things his way and no one else's. And sometimes he can be quite reckless to the point where Ethan has to bail out and help him. And they embody the different working dynamic between the IMF and the CIA. And if that wasn't clear enough, that's also embodied by their bosses. Alec Baldwin returning from Rogue Nation now as the IMF chief. And in his place at the CIA, you have Angela Bassett. And both of them, you would find support in relatively small supporting parts. Although I was very happy Happy to see Baldwin get much more to do this time out, although I do wish that Bassett got some more screen time because she's pushed off screen for large stretches of the movie, and I think that she's a fantastic actress that doesn't get nearly enough to do these days. And I'm not saying this movie is perfect on a plotting level. I certainly think that the film maybe twists a little bit too much, and I think that there is one major plot point that is probably a bit too obvious to the point where even the Mark for this movie pretty much seems to give it up as a foregone conclusion, but I'm not going to spoil it here nevertheless. But what really sends this movie into classic status is that final 20 minutes. I'm still catching my breath from that final stretch of the movie, which is just sensational. That is the stretch of the movie where you have the big helicopter chase sequence and that by itself is just jaw-dropping stuff. I mean you have crews scaling up a rope to climb into this helicopter and then he's piloting it by himself. He's doing that for real and they're doing all these crazy things and it just keeps building and building and building and building but it's not just that by itself, because you've also got what the team are doing in that. It is a absolutely brilliant example of parallel editing, of cross-cutting between the action, because there is no relief, and it just keeps going that much further. You think that they've got to a point where they've plateaued, and then they go even further than that. And at the end of it, I genuinely wondered if I wanted another Mission Impossible movie, because everything is so wrapped up at the end of this entry that I see no possible way that they could go forward. I mean, how do you top this? How can you go past the insane stunts in this movie without Tom Cruise killing himself and I'm not going to advocate for that and also how do you go past a movie this extreme you can't surely without completely reinventing the wheel this is a must see in every sense of that phrase your mission if you choose to accept it is to see this movie right now. Mission Impossible Fallout is not just the best film in the series, it is one of the best action films ever made. An absolute white knuckle ride from start to finish, this entry combines both the series trademark of breathtaking practical stunts with an efficient script that has plenty of intrigue and suspense as it twists and turns. This one very much feels like the payoff for the franchise so far, as Cruz's Ethan Hunt has to face the consequences of his actions, and there is tremendous stakes and jeopardy for all the cast 
that it sustained for the entire two and a half hour running time. Christopher McQuarrie in his second entry in the franchise marshals the action beautifully between stunning set pieces where Cruz's daredevil antics match were astonish and add to the constant tension, quickening the pulse like few in the genre have in recent memory. When it comes to sheer cinematic excitement, Fallout is a shot of adrenaline straight to the heart. If you like this review, then you can join my Patreon, where you can see my reviews early, among other perks, if you choose to accept it. But until next time, I'm Matthew Buck, fading out.